Hey friends, it's good to be with you again today. My name is Ricky James, the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church here in Clinton, Mississippi. And whether you're joining us online or listening to us at Super Talk FM, we are glad that you're here today as we conclude a sermon series called How to Be Generous. And today is also a day in which we begin to collect our commitment cards for the coming year. And so today we're going to be talking about God's expectations for how much we should give. Should we give a tithe? Should we give 10%? Should we give more or less? We're going to talk about that today. And in anything, we're going to talk about how God expects us, because of our blessings that He's given to us, to return to Him a gift. And we're going to talk about exactly how much I think God wants you to give today. So stay tuned, because it's going to be a special day. Welcome. John tells us of a city so high up above Where we'll meet in a spirit of love We'll meet over yonder in that heavenly place Where we'll see each other face to face I can Join me now in affirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, 
friends, as you uh, consider what you're going to make your offering uh, this week, uh, remember you can give a couple of different ways. You can mail your check in to 100 Mount Salus Road. You can uh, do a offering online at firstmethodistclinton.org slash giving. You can drop your gift off if you're in the neighborhood. But also today I want to ask you to consider something else, and that's to make a financial pledge, a commitment to our church's ministry for the coming year. Uh, if you're a member of the church, you're probably going to get a commitment card in the mail. Uh, you can also find that in your newsletter that's emailed out. But also on the website, there's going to be a special place that you can click and fill out your commitment right there on the website at firstmethodistclinton.org. So I want to encourage you to go there right now, in addition to your weekly offering, to make that financial commitment. And if you're listening to us on Super Talk FM and you feel blessed by this ministry, we'd love for you to participate as well, not only in giving, but to make a financial commitment so we can continue the ministry on the radio to share the good news of Jesus throughout the, the region. So you can make that possible. So again, firstmethodistclinton.org. Go there today and make your gift and your pledge. Thanks. of my heart bless your name bless your name Jesus and the deeds of the day and the truth in my ways speak of you speak of you Jesus for this is what I'm glad to do it's time to live a life of love that pleases you And I will give my all to you Surrender everything I have and follow you I'll follow you Will you be my guide, be my hope, be my light, and the way? And I'll look not for riches, nor praises on earth, only you'll be the first of my heart. For this is what I'm glad to do. Time to live a life of love that pleases you, and I will give my all to you. Surrender everything I have and follow you. I'll follow you. Take up my cross and follow you. I will take up my cross and follow you. For this is what I'm glad to do. It's time to live a life of love that pleases you and I will give my all to you surrender everything I have and follow you for this is what I'm glad to do it's time to live a life of love that pleases you and I will give my all to you Surrender everything I have and follow you I'll follow you I'll 
follow you Hey guys, I'm so glad to see you today. I'm Miss Nikki and it's time to spend a few moments with the kids. Today we'll be talking about a big adult word called tithing. Now tithing is giving a percentage, which is usually about 10% of what you earn to the church. So for example, if you earn $10, they say to give a dollar of that to the church and you can keep the rest. But Jesus said there's no need to require Christians to give a specific percentage like that of their income to the church because we are called to love each other as we love ourselves. And following that law of love will meet the needs of all people and truly make God happy. Tithing because you want a blessing from God or because you're afraid that God might do something bad towards you are not the ways to please Him. But giving because you love your neighbor will bring joy to his heart as he sees his children loving others. We're called to live out the love of God and to show it to those around us. So the most important point is that we live a life that's right before God. God counts justice, mercy, faith, and sharing His love as more important than tithing. Even now, God does not desire your gifts if your heart is not right before Him. He loves a cheerful giver, not someone who is giving because you feel like you need to or that you have to. And your relationship with money is important and it has a huge impact on your relationship and your friendship with God, but your friendships and relationships with other people is far more important than that. So Jesus cursed the Pharisees even though they were keeping the tithing laws as literally as possible. They were even tithing the tiniest amount of their garden herbs, but they did it with a wrong heart and they neglected to do the things that God desired most, like justice, mercy, faith, and love. You could be tithing today and still be sinning. You can be giving 90% of your income, most of what you earn, and God will still desire that you ask for forgiveness if you're not doing justice or showing mercy or having faith and sharing love because love trumps giving any day. And the Pharisees would go out of their way to give 10% of their garden herbs, that small percentage, but neglect what really mattered the most, things like justice and mercy and faithfulness. Why? Because they, the Pharisees, they wanted the appearance of being really spiritual without having to do any of the work, like showing love and mercy. So the point Jesus is trying to make here is that we need to give out of love. It doesn't matter how much we give, as long as we give with a joyful heart, and we just need to do our best. Let's pray together. Dear God, please help us to give with a loving heart. Help us to remember it's not how much we give to you, but that we give joyfully. We know that times are hard right now, and that it can make it even more hard to share. But we ask that you touch our hearts and the hearts of our mommies and daddies so that we can give you our best. In your name we pray. Would you join me now in praying to our Lord using the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus does what is, I think, one of his favorite activities in the Gospel, and that's yelling at the Pharisees. Pharisees were a group of religious leaders in the first century, and they often found themselves in conflict with Jesus, or at least Jesus found himself in conflict with the Pharisees over their teaching of the law. And in Matthew chapter 23, uh, Jesus is in the, the, the midst of this kind of long rant against them um, and says over six times, Woe to you, Pharisees, for a variety of reasons, by the way. But one of the reasons that he gets so angry with the Pharisees is over the, the idea of how much we should give to the Lord. And so here on this last Sunday of our sermon series on generosity, I want to share what I think Jesus wants us to understand about how much we should give to God. 
You probably have heard, if you've been around church for any length of time, this idea of giving a tithe. So we're going to talk about that today. Or at least overhear Jesus yelling at the Pharisees about the concept of a tithe. So I want to read that to you from the 23rd chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Just two short verses, verses 23 and 24. Hear this word from Jesus. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. That's just a little bit of a flavor of Jesus' attitude toward the Pharisees. And so this might seem like a, an odd way to start a sermon on tithing, but, but when we take a second look at what Jesus is saying, we realize he's trying to get us to understand how a generous life isn't about exactly how much you give, but instead the reason why you give in the first place. So what is this thing called a tithe anyway? It's one of those Christian words we will use so very often that we don't really stop and, and reflect on what it is and, and where it comes from. Well, the easiest definition is a tithe is 10% of your income or your wealth. 10% that is given away. Uh, and we find it all over the Old Testament. Uh, we first see it in Genesis chapter 14 where Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people, gives a tenth of his wealth to uh, this king called Melchizedek, who's this kind of mysterious king of a village called Salem. And he gives it to the king in gratitude for receiving the king's blessing. Uh, later in Genesis chapter 28, we see Jacob, Abram's offspring, offer a tenth of his wealth at Bethel as a uh, uh, response to a dream he has, a vision from God of a ladder ascending to heaven. In Numbers chapter 18, we, uh, we see that after the exodus from Egypt, when the Israelites were freed from their slavery in Egypt, they're commanded to give a tenth of their wealth in, in, in offerings to support the priests of the, of the tribe, uh, the priests of the people in their work of worshiping the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, we see that every third year, the Israelites are commanded to give a, an extra tithe, a second 10% to support the poor and the widows and the orphans in the community. In Nehemiah chapter 10, after the Israelites return from exile, the Lord commands them to give a, a tithe, another 10% to support the rebuilding of the temple. The reason I want to show you all those different places in Scripture was to show you the, the wide variety uh, of, of reasons why the tithe was given, this 10% offering of your wealth or your income. Uh, the tithe is given in recognition of God's blessings, a response to God's promises, a support to God's servants, a gift to those in need, and a gift providing the worship of the Lord. So throughout the Old Testament, we see this idea of a tithe, 10% of what you have given to God for God's purposes. But you might have noticed that those were all passages from the Old Testament, which raises a question, should Christians, people of the New Testament, followers of Jesus, should, should we tithe? Are we expected to give 10% of our income? Well, if you remember last week when, we, when I talked about the different ways that churches had been funded throughout history, um, what I didn't really get into was that idea of, of, of where does the tithe come from in that history. Because if you remember, the, the first um, you know, 1,700 years or so of the Christian church, uh, individual members weren't really expected to give financially to the church. Um, wealthy members, uh, the emperor, the kings, uh, the, the state itself, the nation itself, would support the churches financially. And it's really not until the 1800s that the idea of individual church 
members should give financially to the church through the offering plate. And it really isn't until in the United States after the Civil War that we see the idea of the tithe actually enter into Christian um, uh, uh, literature. It's really that early, or, or that recent rather. Um, so the, you've probably heard of Sunday school before, right? Well, the idea of Sunday school is a, a late development in the life of the church, late 1800s, until we get the idea of a Sunday school, that you would go to worship and then you would go to this other meeting a Sunday school, an educational format. And we actually see in the Sunday school literature the idea beginning to shape and form that every individual person every week should bring to the Sunday school 10% of their weekly earnings, a tithe given to the church. So that idea of a tithe, even in the Christian church, is new. It borrows from that Old Testament idea. It borrows from this idea that, that we should give to God a portion of what God has given to us. But the exact percentage, the tithe, is relatively recent. So you might wonder, well, did, did Jesus command us to tithe? And did we just forget about it for a couple of hundred years? Does Jesus expect Christians, each one of us, to tithe? Well, honestly, there's nowhere in Jesus' teaching where we see him explicitly command us to tithe. I think he assumes most people understand it as kind of a, a base starting point. But to be fair, there's no place where he says, uh, in order to be my disciple, you must give 10% of your income. But look again at the context of what's happening in Matthew 23, when Jesus is yelling at the Pharisees. Again, if you were to go back and read that whole chapter, you would see that he uses that phrase, woe to you, uh, six times. And each time he's kind of ramping up the intensity of his, of his frustration and his, and his indignation at the Pharisees. And, and Jesus' biggest frustration, his biggest problem with the Pharisees, is that they had, they had turned God's law, which was intended to show us how to live in love and unity with God and with each other. That's the law's purpose to show us the right relationships. They had turned the law into this ever more detailed list of, of do's and don'ts. That if you didn't follow the law exactly as they interpreted it, it, it meant that you really didn't love God, and, and for that matter, that God really didn't love you. And so any mistake, any, any failure to follow it exactly as they understood it, uh, meant that you were outside of God's community and his love. And, and Jesus, Jesus just couldn't stand that about the Pharisees. And now, most people in Jesus' day would actually tithe, right? They're still following the law of the covenant, the law of, 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 of what we think of as the Old Testament. And so they're tithing. They're, and they're tithing what they have. A lot of them farm or uh, keep cattle and sheep and, and other livestock or agricultural produce, right? And and they would tithe off of that. If they had a field of, of wheat. They would give 10% of that crop to uh, God. But what the Pharisees were doing, they were making sure that everyone gave exactly what they were supposed to. They would, they would make sure that everyone was, was so meticulous that, that every single thing that they grew or produced, that they were going to give 10% of that. Uh, they would tithe down to the smallest vegetable or, or herb in their garden, the, the smallest spice if they grew something. They'd have to give a tenth of it, or the Pharisees would, would call them out. And we see Jesus making fun of them in that, in Matthew 23. That says, you know, you, you, you tithe on mint and, and dill and, and, and cumin spice. You tithe on all of that. He's kind of poking fun at them, you know, because he's saying that you're, you're, you're so... You're so focused on the, the minutia that, that you're, you're beginning to look down on anyone who doesn't give exactly how you give or think exactly how you think or who doesn't, who doesn't obsess over the do's and don'ts like, like you do, Pharisees. Jesus begins to call the Pharisees out. And he says, in fact, I, I think you spend so much time calculating and, and judging and, and worried about what everyone else is giving that, that you've forgotten what the law was all about. 
And he says it right there in chapter 23. The law is about justice and mercy and faith. And you've made it about percentages and do's and don'ts. He then even makes a joke. It may not be a funny joke to you and me, but I think it's actually pretty funny when Jesus says, uh, well, he points out, he says, you know, you strain your water looking for a gnat, which is actually something the Pharisees would do. Before they drank their water, they would all carry around with them these little uh, like strainers, you know, like you might strain pasta or, or something, you know, uh, that you've cooked. They would carry around these little strainers. And before they drank any water, they would pour the water through the strainer to catch out any bug or anything that might be floating in the water because bugs weren't kosher. They weren't uh, uh, allowed to eat. And so they would want to make sure that they would make sure they didn't drink accidentally any kind of bug in the water. And Jesus says, you spend all your day straining out the gnat, and then you end up swallowing a whole camel. Again, maybe not a funny joke for us, but in the first century, Jesus is poking fun at this obsession that the Pharisees have. Now, the thing is, what Jesus is concerned about with the Pharisees is that they're so obsessed with the details that they've missed the point. They're so obsessed with the, the minutia and the percentage of the tithe that they've missed the reason why we're supposed to be giving in the first place. We're, we're supposed to give because God has so richly blessed us. We're supposed to give because, because all of it belongs to God. Not just 10%, 100% belongs to God. And we're invited to give a portion back to support others, to support the poor and the needy, to support the worship of God, to support the work of the people of God as simply a way of saying thank you and, and gratitude. That's why we give. Not to meet some magical percentage that will make God love us, but rather we give as much as we can in gratitude for how much God already loves us. So, instead of worrying about whether or not a Christian is mandated to give 10%, and instead of worrying about exactly where you might fall on that percentage, one way that I've begun over my years of ministry to, to encourage people when they ask me, how much should I give to the church or to a charity or, or give in recognition or gratitude? How much should I give? My answer has always been, give your first and your best offering to God. Your first and your best. You see, if you go back through the Old Testament teaching on the tithe, that's really the idea, to give your first fruits, the first portion of your offering, the first uh, grains of your field. Don't give God leftovers. Give to God first. And then we're to give our best, our best crop, our best offering. If we Keep sheep for a living, you give your best sheep to God, not the runt. Give to God first, and give to God the best you can. And that's enough. Whatever it is for you, that's enough. Because if you give to God first, you'll be unable to convince yourself later in the month to, to get something else instead. And if you give to God your best in any moment of your life, then you don't have to worry about whether or not you're hitting some certain percentage. If the best you can do right now in your life and your circumstance is 1%, great, give it. The next month, try for two. Next year, try for a little bit more. But if you give to God first, then that decision's already made. And if you give to God your best, whatever it is, then God will honor your gift. So today, as we end this series on generosity, and as we invite members of our family and anyone who wants to contribute, invite them to make a commitment to the financial uh, spending plan for next year, you might ask yourself, how much should I commit to give? Some of you, We'll give 10% because you've always done that. Thank you. Some of you are blessed to do, to do more. 
And we really appreciate that as you go above and beyond last year's gift. It, it's really important, so thank you. Some of you out there have, have never given before, and, and that's okay. Part about being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, is that we grow. We increase in our knowledge, in our wisdom, in, in our abilities. So I want to encourage you to make that, that first step. You might think, well, I can only give $100 next year. Please, write it down. You'll be glad you did. And then the next year, do a little more. Grow as your ability to give grows. But however much you give, I really do want to encourage you to give your first and your best gift to God. Because all of this is a gift. It's the God who gave his first and his only son that we might have life abundant. So in gratitude for his great blessings and the gifts that he gives each of us, I invite you to make your gift, your commitment, to offer your first and your best to God. Amen. Well, friends, as you go forth this week, I, I hope you realize how much you are blessed by God, how much God loves you, and how, how He wants so many good things for you in this life. And all He asks in return is that you love Him back and that you give your first and your best, whatever that is, so that others can hear of His love for them as well. So go in peace. Amen.